Uh, thanks everybody for coming out to the Santa Cruz seminar. If you're listening to this on YouTube, we went through a lot for you just now. Here with Dr. Baraki and 30 poor souls we've been suffering through the cold all weekend. So now we're nice and huddled in closely. We're gonna answer your questions. Uh, Austin, you wanna read the question? Sure, so we have curated and uh, consolidated some of the questions that were sent in. So we'll start with this first one. Question is, if you have established that a trainee is at the non-responder end of the spectrum, i.e. they're training resistant, and you've been working with them for several months, do you coach them any differently psychologically? And do you just automatically assume that they need more volume? Okay. Uh, so for, you wanna go first? No, go ahead. Oh, I can go. Uh, I guess if I had somebody who I thought was really training resistant, I'm not sure that I would do anything different with differently with them from a psychological standpoint. Like I'm not gonna just yell at them or like reply to their emails in all caps, you know, or like put their training recommendations in all caps or like send them suggested like listening, you know, like they have to listen to only like, you know, Lamb of God during their training session, like receptora, like that. I don't think that that's my management. I, I assume that either the dose is wrong or the, uh, you know, what I'm actually- Formulation. The, the formulation is wrong, yeah. And how I kind of tease that out, if the formulation has many different components to it, meaning that we were using a lot of different variations, different rep ranges, et cetera, and none of that stuff is working, then I don't, th I'm less inclined to think it's the formulation and I'm more inclined to think it's just the dose. Okay, because they should respond to something. Uh, another way uh, said differently is if none of their lifts are going up, I mean, it'd be highly, it'd be, you know, it's not outside the realm of possibility, but if I had, if I had their squat and their bench and their deadlift, their press, none of this stuff was trending up, it'd be unlikely that I got all of that wrong at once, unless it was just the dose. So my general idea would be that volume should go up. Uh, the one sort of thing that's in the back of my mind is if I had an idea that average intensity was too low or too high, uh, which would be hard to tease out initially. That could be something to mess with the formulation, but in general, I would in fact up up the dose if that's my, if that's what I found. Now, if I saw that somebody squat and deadlift were both going up, but their bench and press were not, I'm like, okay, well, maybe it's the formulation. See what I'm saying? So, but if everything was if everything was being held back, then I would probably just change the, the dose. Yeah, I, the only thing from the question, the initial question about doing anything differently psychologically, I would look into that side of things to see if there's anything going on that might correlate with, you know, their lack of response to whatever was most recently prescribed to them. So if they're going through a huge new life stressor, if they had a bunch of, you know, negative life stress that I, you know, talked about during our stress lecture, things like that that might uh, you know, influence their various other aspects of their training, their motivation to go train, the motiv motivation to add weight to the bar, and then ultimately how they end up adapting to the, to the training load. So if there's tons of allostatic load from the rest of their life, then the dose and the formulation that might have worked at another period of time during their life might not be working now because of all that going on. And I might actually have to make changes uh, in with respect to their training because of what else is going on in their life and their psychological state, you know? So sometimes I'll tease that stuff out by just ha asking, hey, what do you think is going on? Why don't you think this is working? And often, similarly to the other questions that I talked about with the pain lecture, if you ask somebody that, sometimes they have very good insight into the issue and they just might dump it all out in front of you and you're like, well, I had this going on, this going on, this going on. And you might say, well, that probably isn't affecting it, but this is certainly plausible that it might. And we might need to adjust your programming or your training. Maybe you're training more frequently than you can handle right now with what's going on in your life. Or maybe we're asking you to do more than is reasonable given what's going on. So yeah. that's, the, that's the thing I would do psychologically is just say, hey, from your perspective, what do you think? Because um, you also want to have buy-in from, the, from, the, from their side. If they don't believe the program is going to work, then that's probably the biggest predictor that it's not going to work, oh, right? So you want them to understand the program, believe in the program, and expect to get benefit. And if you can identify some psychological issues at play that might be you know, causing issues with those things, then you can, you know, you can intervene on that. Uh, the only thing I'll say, in addition, you would know if, if the stress was inappropriate if you were tracking other important metrics like we discussed, like the session RPE and your cue on chronic workload. You, you would have a sense, that's what I'm getting at, yeah. versus if you had no clue but nothing was going up, then I think that my, yeah, mm -hmm. that I would defer to adding volume. All right. 
Uh, how would you change your dietary protein recommendations for people with gout? Any other populations that you would reduce the protein recommendation for? I like this question. Well, I can, of course. I can start right. with it. Carry on. <laughs> so the ideas around uh, dietary protein and gout are actually a little bit less ironclad than you might think when you get recommendations about it from a physician. Um, it turns out that uh, incre from an epidemiologic standpoint, so like observational nutritional epidemiology, uh, that increasing meat and seafood intake appears to be associated with an increased risk of incident gout, meaning like new diagnoses of gout, but not so much correlated with worsen worsened outcomes or increased risk of flares in established gout. At least that's kind of the current evidence on this. Additionally, it seems that the source of dietary protein matters a little bit or has affects outcomes a little bit there. So that, that, that changes when you talk about plant-based sources of protein, dairy sources of protein, things like that. Yeah. The other piece of this equation is that there is now, you know, versus, you know, a couple hundred years ago or, or, or even earlier in the, in the 20th century, uh, medications that can be used to actually lower blood urate levels or blood uric acid levels uh, to a steady state level that in over the long term can decrease the risk of flares. So the point that I want to get at with this question is that going on a low protein diet for the purposes of improving some medical condition itself is an intervention that comes with risks and costs, right? So going on a low protein diet has risks associated with it and you should do it if the benefits outweigh those risks. So in the, in the setting of a patient with gout, uh, I don't know that I would right off the bat recommend something like that unless I had uh, historical evidence that they're very sensitive to this sort of dietary protein intake and they get frequent flares with this sort of deal. Or if despite medical therapy, despite being on something like an allopurinol is a common medication that's used in this situation, they're still getting flares that correlate very closely with certain types of dietary protein. Um, I might recommend shifting them to some of these alternative sources of dietary protein that appear to have less of a risk of uh, inducing gout flares as one, as one possible intervention. But the biggest thing is that there's a strong correlation between obesity and metabolic syndrome and gout. And so overall, we should be dealing with that because that might fix the whole problem is if you can get them to lose weight and improve their metabolic, uh, cardiometabolic status, that can actually eliminate this whole issue and make it so that we don't need to be super concerned with this. I don't think I would say you should eat a very low protein diet, mainly because I don't think that that is probably that is likely to uh, uh, sig significantly improve their outcomes with respect to gout uh, in a prospective fashion. And then similarly, I think that that comes with risks associated with a very low protein diet, you know, yeah, like uh, carrying less muscle mass, carrying less muscle mass, sarcop sarcopenia as folks sure. get older, all the typical things that we talk a lot about. So that's kind of the, the story when it comes to gout. The other quest, part of the question is any other populations that you would reduce the protein intake recommendation for? And there are a few where you'll hear similar things in medical practice. So one, for example, is in uh, patients who have chronic kidney disease, who have established kidney disease. Uh, oftentimes you'll hear the recommendation to go on a low protein diet. And similarly, the idea, this whole, this is probably a bigger topic than we have time to get into right now. But the idea is that that may reduce the uh, reduce the risk of a continued decline in someone's kidney function over time. They might hang on a little longer without declining to the point where, say, they yeah. might need dialysis or something like that. However, same deal. Low protein diet uh, is a situation where that comes with risks. Chronic kidney disease being in chronic inflammatory state, you have a bunch of anabolic resistance, you go on a low protein diet, you're at risk of losing a ton of muscle mass, developing sarcopenia and cachexia and dying from you know complications of that as well as complica complications of cardiovascular disease. So there's one paper actually that I cited in our up to date article that was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine making a case for resistance training in patients with chronic kidney disease, i.e. they should be lifting weights because it is a good way to maintain their muscle mass when they are, you know, recommended to be on a low protein diet. In other words, it's a way to spare them the consequences of, you know, being a negative, pro negative protein balance, negative uh, nitrogen balance uh, if they can train. 
So that's one recommendation that they should train. The other thing is that you should weigh the risks and benefits of this recommendation. You know, you do, it, are you willing to accept the risk of losing muscle mass, potentially having some degree of, you know, sarcopenia and the associated consequences in order to maintain your kidney function for a little bit longer? Now, if somebody's on the teetering on the edge of needing dialysis, that might be something that I would totally say, okay, fine. If that's, if that's something that I expect might push you over into needing dialysis, then that's something that's worth avoiding. But if it's much earlier on in the, in the phase, and I think that they're going to live the rest of their life and never need dialysis, then I'm probably not quite as worried about that as a com complication. The last group I'll talk about has to do with chronic liver disease, uh, patients with cirrhosis, um, which is very, very common. And that's a patient population who are at risk for various complications. And historically, they've also been recommended to restrict their dietary protein. And this has to do with the liver's processing of dietary protein because your liver processes it and helps to uh, ultimately excrete it. They're at risk for accumulating uh, a substance called ammonia in their blood, and they're at risk for complications uh, that can cause delirium and cephalopathy, meaning severe confusion, and they end up admitted to the hospital very frequently from this, and that's from an accumulation of byproducts of nitrogen metabolism in the blood. So historically, they're recommended to go on a low protein diet. However, cirrhosis is a similarly chronic inflammatory anabolically resistant state at risk for losing tons of muscle mass. You put them on a protein restricted diet, they lose tons of muscle mass, they get even more sarcopenic, cachectic, and they die of malnutrition and low muscle mass related complications. So again, that intervention of reducing dietary protein came at a cost for those individuals. So uh, it appears that the pendulum is swinging in the other direction nowadays in the medical literature in terms of how strongly it's being recommended that they restrict dietary protein to the point where they're saying that we shouldn't be doing that routinely anymore for these patients. If you have a patient who has recurrent multiple episodes of what's called hepatic encephalopathy, this kind of confusion related state when they consume dietary protein and they're very sensitive to it, then you can make a case for limiting dietary protein, but you can still supplement them with branch chain amino acids so that you can get that anabolic effect with a lower dose of total dietary protein. You can give them a few grams of BCAAs and get the same anabolic effect that you would get from 20 grams of whey, 30 grams of whey, or a meat, meat source or something like that. So that's, uh, that's, getting down into the weeds a little bit, but those are the main situations that you'll hear about a protein restriction being talked about chronic kidney and liver disease. And I think that among the medical population, the consequences of a low protein diet from a loss of muscle mass and sarcopenia standpoint are too often overlooked for a clinical benefit that may not be worth that risk it being the main point. The last group is little pedi pediatric populations, if they have some genetic condition that limits their ability to uh, process dietary protein, these are called uh, in errors of metabolism. They have uh, you know, metabolic defects or defective enzymes and they can't process it, like PKU, for example, is, is, a, is a common example, phenylketonuria. Um, but those are, you know, things that would be identified very early on in life and they have specialized diets for that particular condition. Um, I think that's most of the protein restriction kind of stuff that I can think of. Yep. I, th I mean, I think the risk benefit discussion is, is totally on point and it, it's hard to emphasize that enough that there are risks and benefits to everything and you have to weigh them. Okay. Uh, actually, we had a really good podcast with uh, Sham uh, Batarje. Uh, rheumatologist. Uh, yeah, he's a rheumatologist in Australia. He's one of my clients. Super sharp guy. Uh, talking about this, his actual dad, his dad has gout and... He talks about his protein, the protein recommendations that he made to his dad. My overall take on this is very similar to yours from a risk benefit standpoint, but also that and, and in that, I think that dietary protein usually as an isolated source is unlikely to be worth the risk in most cases. Now, certainly there's some cases, but most cases, rather alcohol use, addressing the obesity uh, yeah. that's likely, you know, concurrent, like that's the, those are the big things and making sure that like medic medication compliance, like those would be my first three things. And then dietary protein is unlikely to be something that I, I would really go after. But in medical training today and, you know, that that's like, oh, what did you put them on a low protein diet? And it's like, well, I wanted them to live, so I know I didn't do that. <laughs> you know, um, I probably wouldn't routinely recommend that people go on a low protein diet unless they've really had that risk benefit assessment sussed out. So, ask your doctor how protein can help you today. <laughs> so I would end that. Um, okay, can you discuss strategies for improving work capacity in seniors who need more volume? Uh, sure. Yeah, I mean we discussed them. Previously, adding sets on a weekly basis uh, is one way to do it. How I do this in practice, uh, I include them from the start at much lower intensities. 
So the, the extreme example of this is do one top working set, you work up to a set of five at like an RPE nine or so rate of perceived exertion nine, and then your back off sets are at like the empty bar. Because people will say, well, older folks can't tolerate volume. And it's like, okay, well, if you are moving all intensity from this, they certainly can. You know, and if you don't, if, if, if somebody cannot tolerate extra back off sets with the empty bar, then I don't know that they could tolerate the initial workup to, <laughs> to the RPE 9, right? So really how, how I normally program this, because um, I do have a substantial amount of clients who are, would be considered elderly by the fact of being 65 or older, and that's how we define that in the medical literature. How I do this is I have them work up to a top set of whatever rep range they're doing, and then usually they take off 10 to 15% and start with one back offset there. And then on the second week, I'll try to introduce a second back offset. And then I may hold them there for a while while evaluating their response to the training. If their response to the training is what I would consider adequate, meaning their either estimated one RMs are increasing, which also results in a weight on the bar going up on each training session, right, or other parameters of their training that I'm evaluating are improving, then I don't change it until I have to. If they've been plateauing, you know, for a week or two or regressing, then I'll change what I'm doing, usually by adding volume or, uh, or altering the exercise variations or both. That's typically how I do it. But the biggest problem with older folks and developing work capacity is that people are too afraid to let them do the work. If you're afraid to push your older clients to do the work, you're going to leave them undertrained, and that's a real risk. Uh, and if I, you're if, if you're afraid to do it, they're going to detect that, and they themselves are going to become afraid to do the work. Yeah, and they're going to perceive themselves as fragile, perceive themselves as you know unable to adapt, which yeah. itself is has a harmful effect. The worst, the not the worst, but the like most, I guess. Uh, slowest increase or most gradual increase I've ever done. And I think you had a client who did the same thing. I had them, I was having them, they were already training twice a week, right? And I wanted to have them train a third day. And the third day ended up being only just empty barbell movements. <laughs> and then eventually that became a little bit more weight and a little bit more weight and a little bit more weight. And then they were, then that transpired into, they were training three days a week, you know, regular programming. And then on the other two days, they would just go out in the gym and screw around. They would like practice their squats and practice their benches or whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they, yeah, they said I they, you're about. they felt better yeah. doing more movement. It's like, huh, you don't say. Yeah, this guy was probably in his late 60s and he lived in an apartment complex where he had access to like a gym with a bar and a rack down there. And he had initially been training twice a week. And then by the end of this period of time, he was like, you know, I feel best when I go down like literally every day and I get under the bar, you know, and I, and I actually do some squatting and I do some, you know, some pulling in some fashion. Some days it's lighter, some days it's heavier, but the more I do, the better I feel. I'm like, weird. Yeah. It's like the repeated bout effect is being magnified by increased training. Yeah. And if you contrast that to decreased training where you don't get as much of a repeated bout effect, you don't get as much physical activity on a regular basis, you don't get as much stimuli to drive improvements in lean body mass, decreases in body fat, improvements in strength. And you compare the two, you're like, well, duh, the people who are training more are likely to do better. So your goal is to be able to get somebody to train as often as they need to, to make progress and with as much volume as they need to, to make progress. That's, that's the goal. The goal is not to train as little as possible. Yep. That's not the goal, especially from a health perspective. If I can get people to train more, that would be ideal. So, and if you consider what population is likely to have the most amount of medical, the most amount of medical conditions on the most medications with the most risk for like detraining very rapidly to a point that hurts them long-term, it's gonna be older folks. You would love for them to be active. Everybody in here, we want their grandparents, if they're still around, to be training and active and be, you know, on, as much as possible. That would, that would reassure you, not just don't train any more than twice a week because bad things would happen. <laughs> if you say that, that's, uh, that's a problem because that's potentially harmful to those who listen to you. We just hope that people don't listen to you. Uh, in a person who uh, has moderately elevated, so slightly above reference range of blood creatinine, should they avoid supplementing with creatine? You want to start or you want me to? Sure. So uh, blood creatinine is a lab measure 
that reflects the steady state balance of a byproduct of muscle metabolism. So when it's at steady state, that means it's being produced at the same rate it's being excreted by your kidneys, and we use that in medicine as a reflection of somebody's kidney function. Um, However, it can be confounded by lots of other things. And since it's a byproduct of muscle metabolism, it can be elevated in patients who have lots of muscle, and it can be very, very low, artificially low, in patients who have very little muscle. So for example, what's your creatinine? Probably like, well, I don't know, 1.3? 1.3, which mm -hmm. is above the normal range on most lab measurements, which Games. would mean that he has oh, chronic so kidney disease if you just look at it and you say, oh, this is a marker of kidney function without realizing, oh, he has probably above average muscle mass. Stan's creatinine is 2. That was going to be my question. <laughs> Stan, do you know your blood creatinine level? Uh, it was 1.2. 1.2? Uh, wow. Yeah, I know. That's, so that's, I have higher that's blood that's creatinine. Creatinine. I have higher creatinine than you. <laughs> well, sorry. Depends on when I train in proximity. Like okay, sure, yeah. All right. They tested Hawthor the day after the Arnold. Yeah. Just through this group. I can't remember. Oh, Thor? Yeah, I'm not, not surprised. Yeah. Yeah, so same. Mine's also above the reference range, and that just reflects, you know, uh, elevated levels of muscle mass compared to the populations on whom the reference range was determined. Which are like right? 70 kilo males, you know, in the yeah. 1950s. <laughs> right. So, so those tests falsely identify us as looking like we have chronic kidney disease when we don't. And so that requires a little bit further evaluation to make sure, hey, this person doesn't actually have chronic kidney disease. Now, the issue is that creatinine itself is not toxic to the kidneys. It's not a dangerous or a toxic substance. So when it's elevated, it's not a big deal in and of itself outside of what it might reflect. So patients who do have chronic kidney disease, that stuff accumulates and it's just a marker for that. It's not bad. Creatine, as Jordan has written about before, is a substance that is metabolized when it gets, you know, goes through its cyclization process and it gets metabolized into creatinine. And so they did, they actually published uh, their, their paper on supplementation of creatine that if you take the blood creatinine level right after, shortly after taking the creatine supplementation, that can falsely elevate this measurement and make somebody look like they're in kidney failure when they're in fact not. But again, it's important to remember that creatinine itself is not dangerous to the kidney. So if somebody has been determined to have an elevated blood creatinine level because they're jacked, have more muscle mass than usual, then there's really nothing to be concerned about on any front. So both of us take creatine every day, uh, despite having elevated blood creatinine levels to no ill effect. Uh, I would argue that probably patients who do have chronic kidney disease, that there is probably also not an ill effect of taking creatine. I can't think of a mechanism by which no. it would injure the kidneys further. No. However, the only problem would be that it could creatine. potentially <laughs> confound their measurements that their nephrologist is using to monitor their kidney function. There are other measurements that can be used. They're just not used all that frequently in practice. Yep. So it's just a nuanced topic. As, as Jesus, come on, that's my, come on, man. It's my Got word em. too. You take my fire <laughs> joke, you take nuance. What's next? Yeah. So you know? I think, does that cover it adequately? Yeah. All right. I don't have anything to add. Next. What is the definition of a metabolic equivalent unit? So a met or metabolic equivalent unit is uh, basically a linear scale, starts at one, goes up forever. One metabolic uh, equivalent is one kilocalorie per kilogram body weight per hour. So sitting quietly is estimated to be one metabolic equivalent. And because this is a linear scale, if you go up to five metabolic equivalents, that's five, ki uh, uh, five kilocalories. Times, five times the energy expenditure of sitting. Yeah, which is five kilocalories. Yeah. You know, supposed to be five kilocalories yeah. per hour uh, per kilogram. It's so like moderate intensity activity. Yeah, eight for that eight mets sort of cutoff is supposed to be jogging at a slow intensity um, or that incline uh, treadmill. Uh, situation. You, there's a whole, if you Google metabolic equivalents, you come up with this whole list of like different things you can do uh, to reach different metabolic equivalents. All of that stuff has to be couched in what is your previous experience? What is your current training level? Right? So really high level endurance athletes or uh, well-trained athletes are going to have a way different scale. Like Jess's metabolic equivalent scale is different than mine, you know, because she's a savage and I am not. But... <laughs> <laughs> All right. When you have a cold, should you train as normally planned and just adjust for RPE? Question mark. Would illness keep you out of the gym? When would illness keep you? Oh, out when? Of the yeah. Well, to the first question, if you have a cold, uh, should you train as normally planned and adjust for RPE? You should adjust with RPE. I probably wouldn't recommend going to the gym if you have uh, something that's contagious. 
and you're going to a public gym just as like, you know, public health sort of standard, like don't mm -hmm. do that. I mean, I guess you could wear a respirator. <laughs> like, please don't send me your form checks when you're wearing like an SC95. <laughs> <laughs> you could do that, uh, but I, I would train. The only time I've missed training has been when I came back from Vegas. Uh, I had like a Vegas flu for like three days and I couldn't do anything. I, but I also didn't get out of bed. Um, I, so my, my thought is if you can get out of bed, you can move around, you can leave your house and you don't feel like you're gonna infect somebody, you should definitely train. That being said, if you miss a day of training and make it up the next day, like, you know, the world will continue to turn and no one will care. <laughs> Well, seriously, just yeah. like, well, yeah, also to be fair, if you miss training, I won't care either. I don't want you to do that. So I would rather you train like four days in a row than miss your week's training. But if you have to miss training because you feel sick and you feel contagious and you train in a public area in order to not get other people sick, you have to miss training, go ahead and do that. For me to miss training, what would it take? Uh, an act of God? <laughs> if, you had, if, you, if, if you had, if like I active influenza infection and you were like febrile and rigoring in bed at home. Sure. Yes. If I had hepatic encephalopathy, I'm not going to train. <laughs> if I have if I was in septic shock, I'm septic shock, I wouldn't train. Yeah. If I was, uh, you know, had anal leakage, I probably wouldn't train. <laughs> I'm just thinking like, you know, if I had an active infection, <laughs> yeah, that would be. Yeah, I've trained many times with a cold. I also train at home. So the public health concern is not really an issue. And I just, it's just the Lorraine because you don't care. Yeah. Just adjust the weights as I need to. What is the minimum amount of fat that you need to include in your diet. Uh, I've only seen a handful of studies on this where you would become, there's a theoretical risk of becoming potentially deficient in either fat soluble vitamins or otherwise limit, be limited in the amount of essential fatty acids that you can take on a given day. And it was like 13 grams of fat per thousand calories of dietary intake. But these studies were admittedly not long term and nobody became deficient in anything during any of these studies. So I don't actually have an evidence based recommendation for this number uh, in practice. Most people are far, you know, exceed that 13 grams per thousand calorie uh, sort of minimum recommendation. I, I just, I really don't have a bottom end. I really don't have a bottom end. If you're completely fasting for like extended time, periods of time, like weeks. <laughs> That's what I was gonna say. You're yeah, under medical just... supervision and they're going to be evaluating you for vitamin deficiencies and essential fatty acid deficiencies. But right. those people who are doing that either can't eat, okay, or are really trying to lose a significant amount of weight loss. Um, or just trying to undergo a significant amount of weight loss, but I don't have a bottom end like if you're below 30 grams of fat per day, that's too low. And anybody who says that, I would, a citation desperately needed. Like, I, I don't yeah. know that that exists uh, reliably. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the question, how much, what's the minimum amount you need to include in your diet also need to define like for what, like just to avert outright deficiency and like death from it, in which yeah, case it's like, get your essential fatty acids and, and we don't know you don't really, amount. you don't, yeah, we don't know what grandma, you don't really need anything else. What I'm getting at is I would not expect any level of dietary fat intake, low or high, to have a significant impact on how you perform uh, or how uh, w healthy you are, unless it's making you gain weight or lose weight. If it's making you gain weight, uh, particularly adipose tissue, uh, because your c calorie excess is so great, then I, then I think, a. Uh, a it, it, there's a likelihood that your health parameters may become worse if you become obese or overweight. If you're losing weight, regardless of fat level intake, I think that it's likely your health parameters are going to improve with the sole exception being your lipid panel whilst losing weight, because that tends to be in flux and can be all over the place until you reach a steady state again. Why is sleep apnea a risk factor for so many things? What is the mechanism? Is there something specific about sleep apnea or is it the disruption in sleep that is the problem? Yes. Yeah. I okay, mean, cool, next the, question. <laughs> <laughs> the hallmark of sleep apnea is the disruption in sleep. And there's a bunch of cardiovascular and neurologic and pulmonary like lung related consequences associated with sleep apnea when you have the repeated obstructions in the upper airway and your brain gives you this overwhelming sympathetic drive to get your ass breathing again 
that over time results in a bunch of maladaptive kind of physiologic changes. Um, so really complex process. And I agree it is a risk factor for tons of things. That's why we talked about it all weekend. And also a ton of things are risk factors for, for sleep apnea too. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of, a lot of causality going in both directions. So I think, like I said, at our last seminar, one of, one of our good friends is a, is a sleep medicine physician. So we're going to probably try to get him on the podcast at some point in the next year. And we'll talk about, we'll talk about sleep apnea and other sleep issues at length. Yeah. So I guess if I had to answer why is sleep apnea a risk factor for so many things, it's because it affects so many different organ systems. Uh, so the act of either not breathe, like not breathing enough to keep your oxygen saturation levels high enough affects so many different tissues negatively that that's why it's so pervasive. Uh, and then as far as is there, uh, is there a problem with sleep apnea in and of itself? And as far as how that affects systems, or is it just a disruption in sleep? It both disruption in sleep also uh, is is a problem. As far as uh, if you're awake more than you're asleep, then that affects your entire next day, and that builds upon itself. Um, yeah, there are problems with not sleeping enough. So again, there's a reason why we put that stop bang questionnaire in each one of your booklets. I would just take it, just like oh my gosh, I'm at high risk. Well, see your doctor. They will happily prescribe either a home sleep study or a sleep study to evaluate for that. Mm -hmm. And you know what's funny is the auto CPAP stuff. You could theoretically give somebody a trial of auto CPAP, like just because it'll titrate to their needs. Sure. Yeah. It just some extra cost, but you know. That's what I have. Yeah, the auto CPAP. I have an auto CPAP. Yeah. You know, so I stopped using my machine as much. I use my bite block. Okay. Yeah, it, I'm, I want to get a specialized one that's like barbell medicine. So that way, when you like look into my mouth, it's just like barbell <laughs> medicine. <laughs> Since pain isn't necessarily reflective of tissue damage, is there a point at which someone should reduce their initial assumption that they're okay and increase the suspicion of a tissue being physically damaged and in need of treatment? So this individual is asking, when do you not assume that you're okay despite having some pain? And when do you worry about tissue being physically damaged and you need to pursue treatment. So <clears throat> uh, yeah, it's a big topic, but let me try to simplify it as much as I can. All right, do it. So when you experience pain in the gym, if you're experiencing some form of pain in the gym, like a musculoskeletal type pain, this isn't like you're having chest pain when you're exercising, different ball game. Um, then if your physical function is relatively unimpacted, right? You can still do the things. They're just, you know, uncomfortable. Then I would generally be reassured by that sort of thing. And I don't think that you need to go and pursue some sort of fancy diagnostic evaluation and treatment. Similar. So the point being that if there's pain and you're quote, okay, or if there's pain and there's tissue damaged, but you're still okay, like either way, the treatment for it doesn't change. We're going to modify your training loads. We might modify your range of motion. We might modify your exercise selection, but either way, we're going to adjust the training load and work you back towards normal activity. So that the, the intervention that we would recommend does not change depending just based on whether or not there's tissue damage present, right? Well, because well, tissue damage is when there is tissue Always damage happen. to the point where there are like obvious physical deficits, for example, right. you had a ruptured ACL during the course of your, you know, football practice, or you have like a paralyzed limp leg associated with your new back pain that you had or something like that's a different situation that merits some evaluation. But in the absence of those sort of like, you know, new onset, fairly dramatic kind of like new deficits in your function, then the treatment doesn't really change based on whether or not there, we think there is tissue damage present. It's modify training loads and work you back towards your desired activities based on your tolerance. Does that make sense? I'm, well, yeah. Okay. I but, just want to make sure I express that. But I'm... I'm make not your, disagreeing. Make your, make your argument. Well, so <laughs> I view I view this injury thing as a spectrum, right? And and I think you would agree. So I don't I don't actually think it's a disagreement. The idea is that I mean, if we go by the what is the definition of an injury? It's a reduction in performance with a, some sort of morphological deformity or you know or obvious mechanical problem. That's Timka 2014. That's their sports medicine. That's their, journey, their thing. So yeah, if you got a bone sticking out, if you have a, you know, a paralyzed leg, if you have a, uh, you know, an AC, a positive test for ACL injury, then sure, you're at one end of the spectrum of injury. But delayed onset muscle soreness is also on that spectrum, just at the other end, right? You have reduction in performance, you're tender to the touch, your obvious, you know, uh, uh, injury. 
when do you start to worry? It's a hard question to answer. I don't think I ever start to worry <laughs> until there's immediate medical threat that requires evaluation. So an ACL, I'm not worried about. Like that is unfortunate, you know, but am I super worried? I'm like, well, no, but because you have instability in your knee and if that is important to your sport and performance goal, then you need to have some sort of professional evaluation. Am I worried about the bones sticking out of your body? Well, yes, I am. That is something I'm immediately worried about. But, you know, I don't have a hard line is what I'm getting at. Sure. It's just this spectrum. I and think I, the, the, the thing that I took that uh, got me with this question was it seems like they're differentiating between pain or increasing suspicion of tissue damage. Yeah, but tissue and damage. And tissue damage itself does not, like, raise red flag alarms that we no. need to, like, freak out, right? Because tendinopathy, you can characterize as you know, changes in tissue, tissue structure and tissue function and stuff like that. You could characterize tendinopathy as, you know, as a form of tissue damage, but you don't need to freak out and worry about it and go get evaluated and get a bunch of treatment. You need to modify your training loads, yep. right? So yep. tissue damage itself is not like the fork in the road where you decide, oh, I need treatment or I don't. It's deficits in function that may guide that decision a little bit differently. That Depending require on immediate if evaluation. If they're more severe. Right? Yeah. But I don't know where that line is. There, I don't the think immediate there is. medical threat? I don't threat? think there is one. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so do you agree with me? I think so. Oh, man. <laughs> Dad yeah. agrees with me. Yeah. yeah. All right. Did I understand you properly that large belly fat generates its own, ho own hormones? Indeed, you did. Indeed, you did, YouTube. I don't know who wrote this. This is anonymous. Uh, so, yes. It is thought at this point, which we, this is a new area of research, um, that each organ system or each tissue set will, can release its own hormones. Okay. I'll go through a bunch of uh, names because it makes me sound smart and that's good for the internet. Uh, so adipose tissue, fat tissue releases adipokines. These are hormones, uh, biologically active substances that act locally and uh, further away to do a whole bunch of different things. So they act on the liver, for instance, they can store fat there. They can uh, alter production of triglycerides and lipoproteins and, uh, and affect insulin resistance and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, the liver itself makes biologically active uh, substances called hepatokines. Okay. Muscle tissue makes myokines okay, or exerkines, depending on who you read. They, those are the biologically active substances that are released en masse from exercise itself. So uh, I think that 10 years from now, you'll see a lot, of more, uh, a lot more discussion about different tissues that are releasing their own uh, biologically active substances that have not yet been characterized, but that have far reaching effects. The main thing that I can impart upon you is that the human organism is super complicated and that if someone has a simple solution for, you know, that one weird trick, it's probably bullshit. So be, there are a lot of different things going on. No, no more. No, I mean, I think it's, you agree. The other organs that you didn't list are also well known to release things. So kidneys release things that act at distance. Renal sites. kinds. Well, you know, angiotensin or something like that sure. is one example. Thyroid, pancreas, Thyroid pituitary, you know, even the heart releases things that act as sites, BNP, <laughs> stuff like that, you know. Brainokines. So, yeah, there you go. <laughs> I basically made PeriRx out of necessity. I combined all of these supplements that I was recommending into one supplement. It's really easy to use. It's one scoop before, one scoop after. To the extent that you want to get better performance, recover faster, or improve your, the results you're getting out of your training, this would be the supplement I would recommend. Uh, if somebody has had, a sp has had spinal trauma or spinal surgeries, how do I evaluate whether or not it's safe for them to strength train? What constitutes a red flag in this population? Uh, you don't evaluate whether or not it is safe for them to strength train because neither you nor anyone else on the face of this planet can accurately predict that. However, in a litigious society, in the litigious society that we live in, that person should probably have medical clearance, not because they need it or that their doctor is well versed in the nuances of strength training and its risk benefit profile, but because you need the golden ticket, which is a doctor's clearance to say, hey, you can strength train. And if the doctor says you can't, then you need a specific reason why, which you can choose to ignore at your own peril and the potential uh, client's benefit. Now, 
if someone came to me and said they've had history of spinal surgery, they've had a laminectomy, they've had fusions in the lumbar spine or the cervical spine or whatever, I'm not asking for medical clearance right off the bat. I'm only asking for medical clearance if this was recent, right? They're like four weeks post-op or if they continue to have neurological deficits, like, hey, I still feel numbness and tingling in my hand, I just had this neck surgery, is it cool for me to train? And I'm like, well, I don't know the answer to that at any time point, but we should ask <laughs> your surgeon if you've been cleared to exercise. And if the surgeon says no, then you mean, okay, well, what kind of exercise can I do? Because I know that there is an extreme risk of being sedentary. So I think that at no point would a strength coach be able to discern whether it is appropriate or not for somebody uh, to train with any medical condition, unless they have medical, happen to also have had medical training and are gonna be responsible for that outcome. And I think that doctors or other healthcare professionals who are in charge of making these recommendations need to be very specific if they're going to say that somebody cannot strength train. Well, if you cannot strength train, why? And then, what training can they can they participate in? Because they're again the extreme risk of being sedentary. Uh, anecdotal story, which uh, you know is fun to tell. I had a client who was a spine surgeon. This guy operated on people's backs every day. That was his jam. He loved it. Okay. He came to me. He said, Jordan, I want to get stronger. I feel out of shape. I want to be able to operate for the next fifteen years. The guy is sixty years old when we first start. Okay, day one, he comes in, he can't, having him try to do a body weight squat, he goes, uh-uh, it's bad for my back. I said, well, what about a leg press? He goes, uh-uh, bad for my back. I said, all right, well, what about a push-up? He goes, uh-uh, bad for my back, can't do it. It's horizontal, supporting myself, can't. And this guy's got a lot of central adiposity, and I'm like, all right. So I basically, on day one, I had him do supported squats, like he held onto a bar that was in the rack and did some supported squats and realized that it wasn't so bad. Also, he realized that I was an asshole and I was gonna make him squat anyway. <laughs> and he had already paid me a bunch of money, so the point was <laughs> he was gonna squat. Well, within a year's time, the guy had worked up to 275 for three sets of five on a back squat. He pulled over 300 uh, for a set of five. You know, and he, his favorite was the bench press, go figure, because, you know, ortho, so bro. Uh, but, you know, he benched in the mid 200s for, for sets of five as a 60, you know, year old guy. And he was the spine surgeon. And you imagine how tight my butt was when I was having him squat 100 weight for the first time. I'm like, if he has back pain, you know. He's going to come after you. He's going to come after me. And not only that, but none of his patients are ever going to come see me. <laughs> so, uh, also, I was dating his daughter, so that was a that was an interesting deal. <laughs> but that's besides the point. <laughs> what I'm I, I do think that my initial statement is valid, though. Like, if you're a strength coach, it'd be really hard for you to take responsibility for that, especially in the post op post op period. So you need to get medical clearance, and if there's not medical clearance, then you need to get a specific reason why and what can they do. If you're going to be responsible for training somebody. Okay. And if it's you, if you are the person and you need that information for your own, for your own knowledge, I think we could really sum up all post-op questions. Like I just had a hernia repair. I just had, you know, C-section. I just had, you know, this other procedure, whatever, a wart removed. When can I train? And it's like, well, ask the surgeon. And they're pulling that information out of thin air. Yep. It's all made up. <laughs> unless you had breast cancer, uh, radical mastectomy, in which case there actually is data on this, but outside of that population, it's all made up. All right, it's cover, it's cover your butt sort of recommendations. Now that doesn't mean it's wrong, but you just have to clarify, well, hey, if you're saying that I can't exercise at all for four weeks, you're saying I have to be sedentary. Sometimes the answer may in fact be yes. But they may say, no, I just have a fear that your wound is going to open or that this other complication may occur. I don't know what, you know, the evidence is on that. I don't know if there is evidence, but it is unlikely they're going to say you need to be sedentary and not do anything for the next four to six weeks. But that is the question to ask. Don't ask us. Well, because we weren't the surgeons, right? Like, so we don't know if you had this, you know, strange complication, this strange underlying disease. We don't know you, you know? Yeah, how many questions on your Instagram live? Well, yeah, we get asked these post-op questions all the time, and hey, obviously I, I refuse, I, refu I, I can't answer them directly. Sure. So usually it ends up being a What question would you of, do? Yes, we've had many individuals who have come to us after a hernia repair and decided they were going to start training, 
and they've done okay. Yeah, that's like <laughs> the well, most I can skirt around that question yeah. without without being direct and exposing myself to some sort of legal risk from that standpoint. If you had a if you had a inguinal hernia repair, how how soon do you think you would start training? Um, I don't know, probably two weeks. Yeah, I, I think as soon as I felt like not sick anymore sure. or not like oh i can stand up without pain sure i would try to get under a bar. At least upper body stuff might be yeah. sooner yeah i might bench like the same day i mean to be honest like you know i'm like as soon as the anesthesia <laughs> wears off <laughs> <laughs> see what happens uh but the the only other thing i can add to this is the breast cancer data and i i did a youtube video on um sort of post-op surgical like training in general there's one i forget what vlog it was effectively they actually compared resistance training in radical mastectomy patients post-operatively, people who started day one, like post-op training with free weights in their home unsupervised versus people who were counseled to not do anything for four to six weeks. There was no increased complication rate, okay, in the people who trained the day after. Now, the only outcomes they were looking for were complication rates. So, like, how many people had to go back into the surgeon to see them again because they had contracture of the area or they had lymphedema or they had something like that. They didn't have any increased complication rate but there are obvious benefits to exercising. And so that's really what we're trying to, I guess, uh, get in that post-op period, right? If you're like, I need to exercise for my mental well-being, for my physical well-being, you know, it's not like I need to set a new 1RM on my deadlift, you know, a couple days post-op, but to, in order to, for someone to tell you that you can't exercise, you need to know why and to what extent. So if you are having a procedure, if you or someone you love is undergoing a medical procedure, ask the doctor when you can exercise. And if they say you can't exercise at all, you say, so you mean I must be sedentary. And if they say yes, well, for how long and why? And then you guys get to have that conversation about, well, there are risks to being sedentary and benefits to exercise. So which, you know, what outweighs what? As a PT, I often get patient referrals from uh, P PCPs, uh, primary care docs, who have unknowingly nociboed the patient, here we go, attributing normal imaging findings on an X-ray or MRI as their pain triggers. This can be frustrating for obvious reasons. How would you address this situation both with the patient and the doctor? Yeah, this is tough. <laughs> so uh, the issue is that if, if the doctor has referred you this patient, and the patient's coming to you with a lot of preconceived ideas. Remember the data that I cited during the pain lecture about where these individuals get their ideas about their back pain from, right? It was 89% came from their healthcare professionals. So we know we're dealing with people who have learned these ideas from their doctors, for example. If that patient has a very good rapport with their primary care doctor, as many patients do, They've, maybe they've been seeing them for decades and they trust them and they know them and stuff like that. You have no hope of influencing <laughs> that. That's just right. the way it is. If they have that good of a history and sense of rapport with that primary care doctor, you're just, you can't. You need to not waste your time because you're going to be frustrated. If they don't have that sense of rapport with their doctor, then you can broach it in a way that aims to educate the patient without necessarily disparaging or discrediting their doctor. And then after you see that patient, it might be worth your time to try to get in touch with that doctor and say, hey, here's, have you seen this most recent evidence regarding back pain or regarding ex, you know, imaging findings or whatever the case is. And if you support it with evidence, you say, have you seen this paper? There's nothing like offensive about that. If I had somebody who sent me, hey, have you seen this? I'm gonna read it and be like, oh, well, that's surprising, or I didn't know that, that changed my mind. Whereas if you contact the doctor and said, hey, you know, you're wrong about all this stuff, <laughs> like that's not likely to go over well, especially between a PT and a, you know, probably a jerk of an MD who's, who's who, you know, high and mighty about the stuff, right? So you have to, you have to be careful in how you, how you couch the stuff. So if you aim to share this information with the physician, they'll probably be more receptive to it. And hopefully you can say, hey, thanks for the consult, thanks for the referral on this patient. I saw them. Um, and I thought that this paper might be relevant to their care. I wanted to see, you know, see if you had ever seen this before. That might be a way to approach it with the physician. From the patient standpoint, I wouldn't do anything differently than what I regularly do. I say, hey, what do you think is going on? What have you been told about what's going on? What are your expectations about what is going to happen to you? And then if they have incorrect ideas about that, then I aim to gently nudge those in the right direction, right? To say, well, there's a lot of interesting research on this. Would you be interested in learning more about this? 
and hey, yeah, I would love to learn more because I want to learn how to take care of myself and get better outcomes. Cool. Let me share all this information with you. Or they say, no, my doctor told me this and that's, you know, there's no point. So this is what's going to happen. And you're like, well, nope. all right. So Bingo, save. save yourself the frustration so you don't go down that road. So that's why I lead with those questions up front. What do you think is going on? What do you expect is going to happen? What have you been told? That sets so much of the stage for you and what you're going to do. I use those questions every single day in practice with people. So that's the way I would approach it with the patient. And then kind of you have to develop your education skills with folks. And that's also how I do it with the, with the referring doc. Yeah. I think the only thing I'd add is what if you're the strength coach in this situation and somebody comes in and says, I've got this, this herniated disc or this, you know, whatever, that that's my pain center, blah, blah, blah. I don't, I mean, at that point, if, especially if you've been to the seminar or you're really, in, you know, uh, familiar with our material, you get excited. You're like, oh, you don't know what's about to happen to you. <laughs> but the problem is they may not be ready for that message. Yeah. Right. So from a practical perspective, yes, you're going to ask these questions like, well, how do you, what do you understand about, you know, how, why you're having pain and what are your limitations? But training wise, you're going to assume that there are no problems with them. And the main thing is reassurance and education. So if you're like, I'm gonna have you squat on day one, you say, you know, we're gonna do body weight squat first, you're grad gradually exposing them, then put a bar on their back, it might be a training bar, and then it's a, you know, a regular bar, and then you're adding weight, you know, and you're gonna to have to take that as needed, as, as you can. The point is, you don't need to trash the person who gave them the nocebo, that's not helpful to anyone either you, the patient, or the other doctor. Uh, main thing is to provide reassurance where it is appropriate within your scope of practice. So I think if you're the PT in this scenario, yeah, you could ask them, mm -hmm. hey, have you ever seen this stuff? Yeah. You know, and the doctor may say, of course I have, I'm a doctor. Why wouldn't I see everything? You know, but that's the part you're like, well, this is, oh, you know, I can't, I can't really help you. Yeah. You know? There was recently a thread on our forum about this where somebody who had attended one of our previous seminars, who was a coach, was broaching this topic of discussion with one of his clients. And he experienced what's known as the backfire effect. And he posted on our forum saying, holy shit, what do I do about this? He had tried to broach these topics with the patient, uh, with, the, with his client, and the client, it turns out, was not at all receptive to this message. And she was like, frankly, I'm getting very annoyed with the things that you're telling me. <laughs> and it did not go over well. He's like, what did I do wrong, guys? Here's the email exchange. And he listed it on our forum. And uh, myself and a few other folks kind of chimed in and said, you know, it seems like this lady wasn't really ready to hear what you had to say. So next time, maybe try to assess that a little bit earlier so that you can kind of avoid this because he, he learned a kind of a harsh lesson because he was super excited to help this person. Right. And he had a lot of information to share and all this stuff. And she was like, not all right. She was like, it's my L3, L4 disc. That's what's going on. Okay. I don't want you telling me anything otherwise. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's difficult. That's difficult. To, to manage. And so it takes, you're going, if you decide to start trying to work with people and have these discussions, you're going to experience some of these frustrations and you have to develop some thick skin and some willingness to deal with that sort of thing. And you develop the skills on how to navigate those difficult conversations with people. Yeah. Um, the social, the social side of this stuff is, is the thing that's most interesting to me and the most rewarding to me, but it's also the biggest challenge is working through a lot of those things and working through everything somebody's ever been told about their condition. And how do you get your foot in the door to start to change their beliefs about something? It's very difficult. Instagram live. Yeah. Oh, um, no. Uh, if money and ethics review boards weren't a concern. <laughs> starting out well. <laughs> Good. <laughs> what study would you like to see performed that you think would benefit the greatest uh, to the fitness and healthcare industry? Oh, Jeez. So not only am I tasked with thinking of the study that I think would be the most important to one of those industries, but I am tasked with thinking something that the IRB wouldn't approve. <laughs> so that's like a double, it's like uh, two middle fingers. Um, well, I think what I would like to see is a prospective trial well, it, it'd be, a, a, you'd have two arms and half the group would be involved in resistance training and uh, aerobic training like five days per week, right? So they would strength train three times a week and then aerobic train twice per week and you'd follow them for like 25 years. And then you'd have an age matched control 
on the other end, who was not allowed to exercise for 25 years. <laughs> so no IRB board would approve this because they're like, that's unethical because we understand the benefits of exercise. And I would say to them respectfully, well, do we? Because while there is a lot of exercise science data out there, we don't have this direct comparison to people who have been matched for socioeconomic status, age, you know, all this other stuff. And then you guys get to exercise, and you, but you guys cannot. And neither of you can smoke or whatever. Can All of you, you recruit have to smoke. people by medical condition and stratify them accordingly? So yeah, so that a, would be great. The subgroup analysis. Cohort, you have yeah. a cirrhosis cohort. You have yeah. a chronic and it would be huge. Cohort. It would be huge, right? This is obviously huge. Yeah, this would, be, this would be like a, yeah, so we'd have, you know, like 50,000 patients. <laughs> Amassing all chronic medical conditions, <laughs> yep. right? Equally represented in both groups. Yep. And then the one group can't exercise. Yep. And then the other group has to exercise. <laughs> uh, and then I would really, at the end, we'd be able to definitively say, what is the risk of not exercising? And what is the benefit of resistance training? And you'd have all the subgroup analysis and you'd have studies for the next 150 years being published, you know, from this stuff. Like we reanalyze the data given new statistics. You wouldn't actually have to have a no exercise group. The, the comparator could just be usual care. That yeah. would probably be good enough. And you then can do both. that would make you a bigger, better case for why you need to change your practice. Sure. Because your usual care is clearly inferior. Sure. That Although, be. but still, I, it'd be hard for IRB to like sure. approve yeah. any of this. It's fun to think about. But it is yeah. fun to think about. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I don't think it would be a nutrition study, though, is what I'm getting at. Because that's less interesting to me outside sure. of like. You well, know, here's the, here's the unfortunate thing is probably even if we had a trial with a result of that size, how likely is it to like just completely shift practice in the direction we we'll want? We'll call it the GAIN study. <laughs> it's got to have a name. All right. Yeah. I mean, no, because well, I think we have more than enough evidence to make a lot of these recommendations now. But well, it's you not would because like, big exercise is sending you checks. That's true. Yeah. 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 So that's Greg Glassman is just sending you money. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I don't know. Is, would you do anything different? No, I mean, I think like that's, a recreational. If it was going to be an exercise trial, then that's fine. The only other trial would be like a CBD oil thing just to like really <laughs> just to nail the hammer. Just, just to definitively <laughs> suggest like, hey, you know, there is literature out this on, or, there is literature out there on cannabinoids and they don't work for all of the things that you're putting discount codes in bio for. So that if the person <laughs> who you're following is putting discount code in bio or extolling the benefits of cannabinoids, Okay, then you should unfollow them, also report them to Instagram for spam or abuse, right? And then, you know, send them any link to any studies that is reviewing cannabinoids. So that's, that would be my second choice. Sure. Given the potential for deconditioning and sarcopenia for patients in the acute hospital setting, how can resistance training be applied effectively to counteract this? I suggest a squat rack in every patient's room. What systems are in place uh, now that can be utilized effectively and what changes need to be made to optimize outcomes. So, yeah, this is a topic of huge interest for me. So it's the acute hospital setting, which is where I work, deconditioning and sarcopenia, which is something I see literally every single day in essentially every patient that I admit, except for the rare, you know, basic training military recruits that comes into the hospital or something like that. Right. Hyperject. Um, and so the issue, the issues are numerous, I should say. Uh, this is not a simple problem at all, but so we have ample evidence that in the setting of acute illness, acute medical illness, uh, critical illness in particular, that there is a rapid loss of muscle, uh, muscle loss early and rapid loss of muscle, loss of muscle mass when patients come into the hospital, seen anywhere from 20 to 40% loss in muscle cross-sectional area in the quads, for example, in the course of critical illness, when somebody comes into the hospital, critical illness, myopathy, that's yeah. Yeah. Uh, and there are numerous other complications associated with that. So it's early and rapid. The problem is that both during the acute hospital stay and the post-acute care, meaning when they go to their rehab facility or whatever, wherever they go after the hospital, something around 70% of patients who are discharged from post-acute care are discharged from that rehab facility below the level of function that they were at before they ever came into the hospital. So. Does that make sense? So they're functioning at a certain level. They got sick. They got worse. They went to rehab. They were discharged from rehab still worse than they were before they ever got sick. That's a huge problem. So this is recognized in the physical therapy world. The Choosing Wisely campaign 
uh, is a campaign of all these various medical and uh, healthcare professions specialties um, that makes very, very high value care recommendations, the things that are most important in that specialty of care. And so the American Physical Therapy Association, uh, I think it's their like number two recommendation in their list of guidelines is don't prescribe underdosed strength training interventions for older adults. You yeah. don't prescribe underdosed strength training interventions for older adults because the tendency is to prescribe underdosed strength training interventions for those individuals. Well, They're too see. light and too low in, in exercise volume to accomplish anything useful. And they recognize that. But I don't want to hurt people. Right. That's the concern. There is massive risk aversion among healthcare professionals. You, you, ha you have a, this older person who says, oh, my knees hurt. My back hurts. My fingers hurt. Well, now you're going to take up Matthew Gilmore. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so there is a lot of risk aversion, and there, and and that brings into play the whole cultural issues around surrounding pain, right? So that whole lecture I talked about, right? So if they have knee pain, the tendency is to say, "Oh, we're just not going to do this exercise." Or that's why I can't exercise because I have knee arthritis. Because as a society, we're very bad at handling pain and dealing with it in the ways that I described earlier today. So the, the, the issues are numerous. There are the severity of illness, the high acuity kind of ill patients that we're seeing nowadays, the underdose strength training interventions, the issues with chronic musculoskeletal pain that limits our ability to get people to engage and buy into this level of care. Um, and on top of that, most of the acute hospitals that I've been involved with are understaffed from a physical therapy standpoint. They don't have yeah. enough of these folks who can devote enough time to the admitted inpatients. Now, we have lots of evidence that doing that intervention in the hospital setting can improve outcomes. I cited a paper in our up-to-date article, for example, of ex resistance training for, exercise, for, for patients who are admitted to the hospital with acute exacerbations of their COPD. Like during their exacerbation, when they're having difficulty breathing, they were doing resistance training with these patients and they got better outcomes. That was kind of a crazy study to see that that existed. Well, and comments. I wouldn't be surprised to see the same thing in many other, in many other contexts. But I think there are just so many layers to this in terms of adequate staffing, adequate time, adequate understanding of appropriate exercise dosing, and also patient buy-in to the process versus their fear or their discomfort or their unwillingness to engage in something that's uncomfortable. So I wish there was a simple answer to this. When I round uh, on patients in the hospital, I actually wrote a post about this recently. I had a patient who I was getting ready to discharge soon who had come in for an exacerbation of their heart failure. And uh, he was telling me about how he was feeling unsteady on his feet and he was not feeling particularly strong. And I did a quick screen for sarcopenia with him, which involved a repeated uh, sit to stand in the chair. So I had him try to stand up from his chair five times in a row without using his arms and seeing how quickly he could do that. And he failed the test. He was not able to do it quickly enough. Uh, in fact, I don't think he was actually able to do it without using his, his arms, arms which is, yeah. a, you know, that reflects that your hip musculature is not quite strong enough. So I was able to sit down. I had fortunately had the time available where I could sit down and counsel him and tell him, hey, this is going to be your starting exercise when you go home. You need to get yourself to the point where you can do this without using your arms. So if you need to do a set of eight or a set of 10 reps using your arms on every on every rep to start out with, that's fine. Whoa. Next time I want Whoa. you to do one rep without using your arms. And then the remaining you can do pushing yourself out of the chair with your arms. And we need to work to the point where you can do a set of 10 without using your arms or something like that. And that would result in such a dramatic improvement in this individual's level of function, right? It would be life changing. Just the ability to get up out of a chair repeatedly without using your arms reflects a profound change in physical strength for that individual. They're still weak as hell by our standards, right? Because they're not squatting 500, but that's never going to happen. But getting them out of a chair without using their arms could change their life. Yeah. Conversely, the typical in interventions that I'm seeing done on these patients is that they're laying in bed. And what will often happen is they'll, the, the therapist will take some sort of stretchy rubber band, tie it around one head of the bed, tie it around another head of the bed. And the patient is there like pulling rubber bands while they're Don't lying in bed. Don't do that on camera. Yeah. So that's one thing that I've seen done, for example, or, you know, quad pumps, squeezing their quads or lifting their legs up off the bed. For some patients, that's literally all they can do is just lift their head or lift their legs or lift their arms up off the bed. But the idea is that any of these training programs need to be appropriately dosed. That's what that guideline says. Appropriate dosing means it needs to be progressive, it needs to get harder. So when I have a patient, I actually recently had a patient in the hospital for 85 days, they were there for severe, multiple severe medical conditions. By the end of their hospital stay, over the course of that many weeks, they had progressed from being in bed, pulling the stretchy bands, to standing at the side of the bed for about 
25 seconds or so. They could stand for that long and then they had to be put back in bed. And I think that we probably could have gotten a better outcome if the exercise had been dosed a little bit more aggressively for that individual. Because medically, they didn't have a reason why they needed to you know, stay more conservative. Um, so I think that the dosing is inadequate. But of course, if the patient's unwilling to participate in an adequately dosed intervention, then you're limited there too. Sure. If the therapist doesn't have enough time to participate with the patient, you're limited there too. If you don't have enough therapists, you're limited there too. So just so complicated. Uh, I wish I had a better answer. You, you weren't worried about overtraining the person? I was with not, them. in fact, worried about overtraining nice. my hospitalized patient. Yeah, I think, I think you know, so I, I tell you, I got reprimanded for my, my I had a, in our electronic medical record, what you, when I was in residency, you could, you could write your own, like, like quick phrases and quick, like, okay. you know, when you, I was making my automatic note. <laughs> and uh, so I would have this little, and I, I, it was dot gains. <laughs> okay. And so at the end, it was a double protein a diet and a manual resistance training for therapeutic exercise via physical therapy. So I would all, always call this consult with physical therapy and always recommend that they got double portions for protein. And I got reprimanded. They were like, why are you doing this? And I'm like, well, you know, clinical <laughs> illness myopathy is a huge problem. So overcoming the anabolic resistance through dietary protein <laughs> increases my clinical rationale for that. But they and loved then, you. <laughs> oh, they, you know, in addition to many other shortcomings that I have. Yeah. Is, uh, <laughs> yeah. And then rep uh, recommending manual resistance therapy. I, I, there's probably not a, a good, there's probably not a good thing that you could do right now in the given, the given system. Yeah. It's probably very difficult. Well, I mean, I think the thing you can do if you are a therapist working in that event in that setting is the exercise selection and the dose you can probably change. Hundred percent. Yep. Right. Yeah, because it's up to your judgment. Pulling anyway. stretchy bands for this patient's eighty week hospital or eighty day hospitalization was, in my opinion, inadequate. Yeah. Well, malpractice uh, is what. what well, I'm, say you know, what you say. I'm, say I'm, what you want to say. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I would have intensified the intervention earlier. Did it hurt the patient? Potentially. Well, may have. All right. Is there any research being done on pain neuroscience education targeted at children? In other words, can we inoculate folks from harmful conceptions of pain? Wait. Pain can, at any age. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. At an early age. Yes. So I like this question. So, you know, I made the case during the pain lecture about the importance of kind of these kind of beliefs and understandings about pain and how we start to acquire them from a very early age. So this research is being done for anybody interested in the topic. Uh, Adrian Liu, uh, A-D-R-I-A-A-N-L-O-U-W is the name of the, of the researcher. He's a therapist and neuroscientist uh, researcher. He is kind of the guy who's done the most kind of research on this topic. He's also published some research on actually doing a 30-minute pain neuroscience education intervention. So like what I did for three hours this morning, except a 30-minute version of it. Uh, for middle school kids and they did a pre and post test and showed dramatic improvements in their understanding about pain uh, and how it works and what it means and things like that. So he's shown that you can educate young kids on this stuff and actually have a significant impact. So Adrian Liu is kind of the guy to go to. He's published a bunch on it. So I'll go read there. So yes, we can inoculate folks from this stuff at an early age. The only other thing to consider is that, of course, those kids also have parents. And remember the influence of parental <laughs> influences on this Can stuff so parental catastrophizing parental you know attention to symptoms all that stuff influenced kids outcomes from from with respect to pain so uh, that's the other avenue that you need to because you don't want to like inoculate the kids and then the parents just override the stuff and keep doing the same behavior so ideally everybody would know this stuff and everybody would have better kind of understanding and relationship with pain and you know there'd be much less issues with opioids there'd be much much less issues with you know rehab guruism and you know placebo dependency and all kinds of other silliness so. yeah if you're in a position of power you have the ul the ultimate responsibility here yeah so that's the thing that's why when you know certain people on the grams post you know a mushroom cloud coming from someone's back you know that's get a, a problem little a little triggered you know that yeah. there's a gl glitch in the matrix we have to feel like we have to respond yeah it's ultimately not a good use for time With the whey protein, people kept asking us, which protein should I take? What do you recommend? And when we looked into it, we didn't really feel comfortable recommending any protein. So we just made our own. Only got four ingredients, the essential amino acid content, and BCAA content, very high. It's exactly what you want out of a whey protein.
All right. As a coach, what is the most important piece of wisdom you impart to a lifter? Oh, uh, man, the most important? <laughs> I, you know, I, I think probably the... I guess if we're thinking about you know levels of importance, we're thinking about what is the th what are the things that you that I that I have to say most often to most people like they didn't know this before. Sure. You know, so I I think that the biggest thing that I have to re impress upon people is that the duration that you need to train to likely achieve the goals that you want is going to be longer than you think it is. It's it just a long time. You know, if you look at somebody and you like, I want that, there's a lot behind that. It's not, well, what six month program do I need to follow? What 12 week program do I need to follow? Which template is best? Which yeah. template, which template is best? I don't have a 10 year template. Like, I, <laughs> you know, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I think if it's taken you less than a decade to get to where you need to be, then that's, that's an outlier type yeah. scenario. So. I would, for people who are new to this and are very excited, I do not want to, you know, uh, dissuade you from going after this whole hog. I, my my thought is that to just tell you this is a long term sort of deal, and it sounds so cliche, like oh, it's a marathon, not a sprint, but it really is. I and and to that end, I do not care where you're at at three months. I do not care where you're at at six months. I care where you're at at three years, six years, 10 years, 20 years, especially if you're younger and you're just starting out in the strength game and you wanna you know, really, really get stronger or gain a bunch of muscle mass or whatever. Like it just, anything that is promising you to gain, get a ton of muscle in three months, like that's irrelevant in a 30 or 40 year training career, you know? Sure, yeah. Uh, I think so, while you were formulating your response, uh, I formulated a similar response that was just going to be summarized by the concept of embracing the process, oh. which is effectively saying the same thing, but also with the added realm of when you have setbacks, you have to similarly embrace the process when it comes to dealing with those setbacks. Nice. That means pain and injury in the same way that there's no, you know, eight week program to like, you know, Mr. Olympia, there's not going to be a boom, all of a sudden my ache or pain or injury are gone like that. And that's just, you know, the quick fix to it. You have to embrace the process when things are going great. You have to embrace the process when things are not going great. And either way, uh, embrace the process for a very, very long time. And then, you know, you can accomplish, guaranteed you can accomplish a whole lot more than you think when you start, if you embrace the process and do it for a very long time and don't miss training. Yeah, and we say that, that how old are you? 28. Yeah, 33. Stan, how long have you been training? 30 years, over 30 years. Right, yeah. So when people say, you know, <laughs> where's your eight-week program, Stan? <laughs> they should to, to just, yeah, just do this one program, repeat it, you know, for yeah. 30 years, you'll be fine. All right, so as a coach, what is the most important piece of wisdom you would impart to a new coach? It is not the same thing, although I do think that the learning process takes a long period of time. Uh, most it, you know, the interesting thing is with great, with people who I think have a lot of actual raw coaching skills, like they're great, they have a good eye, they can program, they know how to counsel people on nutrition, they feel uncomfortable selling themselves, right? And then on the other hand, people who are like super, I'm good with selling myself, they have no skills to sell. And it's like, push you together, be the same person. So I... I am more concerned about the person who has a huge skill set, but will end up be they're going to be selling insurance in five years because the fitness industry doesn't pay them enough because they won't actually ask people for money. So my the most important piece of wisdom I would impart to a new coach, if you have a good skill set and you're developing your skill set, and I know that you are because you're listening to our stuff, is that you actually at some point have to sell your services because we need you in this industry. Okay, we need you to stay here. We need you to continue to become a subject matter expert and we need you to sort of help this fight. You know, you can't go on to another job after this. View this as your primary vocation and be able to ask people for money because you're the expert. And if you're not the expert, try to get better. That's my biggest thing because if the person who's already ready to ask for money, then I'm like, you just need to read more stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that probably if if most of the people who walk away from this seminar and, and you get asked, what was like the overarching theme of the weekend? You're probably going to say something like, man, they just kept talking about how everything has these biological components and these psychological components and sure, these sure. social influences to sure. everything. And it affects nearly everything. And I think a 
deep understanding of that would be what I would wish most coaches would understand, both from a programming standpoint, from a training standpoint, sure. from a pain injury standpoint, from a health outcome standpoint, all of that stuff. I would wish more people would understand um, because there are lots of people who are, you know, say they're very good technique coaches, for example, they can get anybody squatting, they can get anybody deadlifting. And then they turn around and right on the other hand, they infuse this rigid biomedical structural view of pain and injury, and then screw this person's mental approach up to training and, and how to rehab their injury. And they think that they're all misaligned and that they're all jacked up and hopelessly broken. And they, you know, things like that, or similarly the influences of their words when they're talking to it, to an older person or to a female or something like that. And the influences that that might have on somebody. So I think a deep, deep, like really, I wish I could like convey in, in better words, how deep of an understanding I wish people would have of this and choose all their words accordingly when they're interacting with somebody. Oh. Uh, and that doesn't just extend to coaches. That's to literally Doctors, anybody, yeah. anybody who's in a position of authority. And then even lay people can afford to have this so that they know the influences that they are having on people around them. Right. When they're just interacting with all of you, interacting with one another, you're all influencing one another. All of you are watching one another, taking cues, learning your responses to things. It's just fascinating to zoom out and observe when you have an appreciation for it. And I wish more people would. Uh, this weekend, you discussed a lot of health related numbers, BMI, blood pressure, LDL, etc. Do acceptable values for these markers increase as you age? Um, for some do. Some yeah. Do. For those yeah. particular metrics, no. Well, uh, blood pressure. Yeah. So blood pressure used to blood pressure targets or goal goal numbers for blood pressures. What As folks get older and older, sometimes we yeah, sometimes change, we, do. We, we change some of those things. Sure. Sometimes. But I guess what I what I'm getting at is that I would not expect age universally to increase the, the acceptable range. Some. Oh, yeah. Maybe. Across the board for health markers in general. Right. It's sure. Yeah one by one that we look at. So for example, you know, we treat a lot of high blood pressure in folks, especially as they get older. And, you know, as folks get older, especially if they get sarcopenic and frail and they're on multiple medicines and the more aggressively you treat their blood pressure, sometimes the more often they are to get lightheaded and dizzy and fall and break their hips or have bleeding in their brains and all kinds of nasty stuff that we see. So sometimes with an older person, we might say, Hey, yeah, I'm not too upset. If you have a blood pressure 145 or 150 or something like that compared to a younger person that we might treat that a little bit more. Well, we would treat that a little bit more aggressively. Sure. BMI don't really change that. No. I don't think too much LDL or, or non HDL cholesterol is the more preferred metric that I talked about. Uh, don't necessarily change that one as folks get older either. Yeah. Although our, how aggressive we are with treatment by the, you know, an 85 year old person who's still on their statin and they've never had a heart attack before. I'm not feeling too hot about continuing that and everybody depending on the context. Wow. Sure. I might, but I don't think it's getting a benefit at the, you know, at that sure. age. So, it's just, you know, I don't think we can give a blanket answer to this. It kind of depends on every single individual metric. Please to, uh, clarify the thermic effect of food. This is the ca uh, caloric expenditure that is involved in digesting the food, literally breaking it down into its constituent components, uh, absorbing it into the bloodstream and storing it or using it as energy. So protein and fiber tend to have higher thermic effect of food than, carbo than other carbohydrates, which are all higher than fat. This is part of your total daily energy expenditure, which again is the sum of your physical activity, your thermic effect of food, and your basal metabolic rate. So if you increase your thermic effect of food and nothing else changes, then your total daily energy expenditure goes up. You could do this theoretically by increasing your dietary protein and, and or dietary fiber, as long as you didn't increase your total daily cal calorie intake. That's the thermic effect of food. You talk about lifestyle choices that enhance performance. I noticed the bottle of whiskey at the desk. There were actually two. Uh, with that being said, how often do you drink alcohol? I pro per week, like if it's just a regular week, maybe once a week, zero how, how to one. How many drinks? Uh, one to two, maybe. Yeah. yeah. I probably have anywhere from zero to on the highest end, three drinks in a given week. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. Most, most days, uh, or well, most days is zero. Same. Most, most weeks are zero. Yep. If we have a seminar and it's you people's fault, no, uh, <laughs> you guys drive me to drink. No, I, uh, yeah, it's probably one to two per week. Yep. Uh, why does salt supplement, why does the salt supplementation information you have provided recommend not using sea salt or Himalayan salt? Uh, so I guess this involves a clarification. My, I don't have anything against any particular brand of salt 
and similarly, I don't endorse any similar or any brand of salt in particular. The, my problem is that when you start pick, uh, picking different brands, you get different amounts of iodine, you get different amounts of sodium, you get different amounts of other micronutrients, which I think make it hard to recommend universally because of the availability. So I talk about mostly table salt because that's so ubiquitous. It's everywhere. It's very common. It's very cheap. And I don't know if I could reliably say that there's a benefit to using a particular brand of salt. I am undeterred and not worried about, you know, the particular processing that goes into table salt. I think it's fine. And I think it's fine given my, the current recommendations. I think if you want to use a Himalayan sea salt or a particular brand, then that's fine. You just need to investigate how much sodium is actually in the thing, right? And does that, and does my use correlate with the given range that we talked about? Um, other than that, I just don't care. Yeah. I don't care at all. You don't care at all. This message is not brought <laughs> to you by any particular salt company. Yeah, I think even on a bigger picture though, if I had repeated and reliable evidence that suggested that a particular type of salt consumption universally or most of the time did better than regular table salt, I would recommend it and vice versa. You know what I'm saying? I, sure. just, don't, I just don't care enough to make that recommendation. So my recommendation is about sodium intake by hook or by crook. And I don't make any specific recommendations about other trace micronutrients because I don't care. <coughs> hey man, first one 2019, done. Thank you guys so much for coming. You guys are great. We'll just...